the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, I'd like to read again the first seven verses. We're talking about the first, first, uh, yes, first seven verses. We're talking about the blind man and his healing. That's the second message. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and he made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came see. It's a wonderful story. It's the story of Jesus. And the entire Gospel of John is the story of Jesus. Oh, way back when I was a little boy, I remember hearing that the Gospel of John was the sinner's Gospel. And that it told the story of Jesus. And I was running through the chapters of John in my mind today, thinking about the various ways that Jesus presents himself to man in the Gospel of John, and then I thought of the different ways that man is presented to himself in the Gospel of John. For instance, in the first chapter, one of my very favorite passages of Scripture. I love to read it, I love to preach from the first chapter of John, because it seems like that in that chapter everybody is coming to know Jesus. Just a continual story of men who came in touch with the Savior. Starts out with John, who was a, a witness to that light. He, he wasn't the light. He said he wasn't, but he was a witness to that light. And it tells how John came and preached the true light and held him up before men and glorified him in his ministry. And he only had one text. I like to preach about John too. He only knew one text. His text was basic and it was simple, yet profound. It was, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Every message centered on the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he was the fulfillment of all the Jewish sacrifices and all of the offerings. John preached Jesus. That's all he ever preached. His preaching was successful. And the reason I know it was successful was because the many people who followed John uh, after they sat under his ministry for a while, it says that they stopped following him and started following Jesus because he preached them to Jesus. They started out fascinated with John, but they ended up fascinated with Jesus, and I think that's the exact process that the Holy Spirit uses. So we have John preaching Jesus, and we have Andrew and Peter coming to know him. We have Nathaniel and Bartholomew. We have these precious men in the first chapter who saw themselves and then saw Jesus and came to know him and love him. So in that first chapter we have Jesus presenting himself to man, showing man what he is. In the second and third chapters we have him offering himself to man as a savior. In the fourth chapter, if you'll read it, centers around the story of his visit with the woman at the well of Samaria. We have him making known to man that man is thirsty and that his eternal thirst can only be satisfied in Jesus. In uh, chapter 5, we have him dealing with the lame man, showing the infirmities of man and the need being met again in Jesus. In the sixth chapter, we have the great chapter on the bread, pointing out the eternal hunger of man providing the answer to that hunger in the Lord Jesus, who was the bread who came down from heaven. Chapter 7, he presents the eternal thirst of man again. And how the indwelling Holy Spirit, making Jesus real, is the only real satisfaction to that thirst. Chapters 8 and 9, we have him presenting man as blind. In the darkness of sin, groping, stumbling, not knowing where he comes from or where he goes, needing someone to open his blind eyes that he might see. That's where we are now in this ninth chapter. 
And this is what the story of the blind man is all about. It's the story of Jesus. It's the story of what he came from heaven to do. It's the story of his saving work. It's the whole story of the gospel. It's the story of the entire Bible. Human race, blind, standing by the side of the road, stumbling, falling in the ditch, perishing, sitting and begging. And Jesus, the Savior, coming down where we are, passing by where we are dying and offering us life, sending us to the pool to be washed, to come see, changing our lives, transforming us by grace through faith. This is the story of the gospel, and it's the story of what happened with the blind man. One thing occurred to me since Sunday about this blind man in regards to the disciples. Now, these disciples saw this man, too. They were walking with Jesus. They were kind of like bodyguards around him wherever he went. They were always with him. And as they journeyed down the road and came near to where this man was standing, Jesus saw him, and so did the disciples. Well, they mentioned him first before any mention is made in this story. But it was interesting to me that the only thing they saw in the blind man was a theological problem. Not a bit of pity is demonstrated in their talk about the blind man. Not a bit of compassion is expressed. Not a bit of concern. It's Jesus who is concerned with this man. The disciples only look at him and try to get a theological problem solved, and that is, who sinned, this man or his parents? It's the only thing they have to say about the blind man. They come by and look at him, and they see something that challenges their theology. Jesus sees a poor blind man who, see, who needs his eyes open, who needs to be saved, who needs to be delivered. And this was a precious revelation to me because it points out that salvation, the salvation of this man, and the salvation of any man begins in the grace and in the mercy and in the compassion of the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus doesn't stop to deal with him because he asked Jesus to stop. The man is not seeking Jesus. He's not crying out to Jesus. The man is simply standing there or sitting there, whatever the case may be, in his blindness. And his condition, his pitiful, helpless condition, was the only plea, the only cry that ever reached the Lord Jesus' heart. Jesus saw him where he was. Jesus saw him as he was. And Jesus was moved and touched by grace alone, and drawn to him by grace alone, and in compassion. I don't think that this blind man, I can't see that he was doing anything to get saved. He was just sitting there in his darkness waiting to die and go to hell. But Jesus knew his heart. And apparently in his heart was the desire to see. Apparently in his heart was the, the desire to see and to walk and to live like others. So he doesn't raise his voice to ask. And I think there's something of a humility and a humbleness manifest in this man that indicates that perhaps he knew somewhat of his condition. <coughs> Wouldn't ask the Savior to help him, feeling himself unworthy. But he sits there with a longing heart. And apparently Jesus saw what was in his heart because he stopped. There were many blind men along the way. But he didn't stop at all of them. He stopped at this particular man who had been born blind, who was blind from his birth. And that indicates a state of hopelessness, a state of despair. Like the man had come to the end of the line. It wasn't that he just lost his eyesight and said, well, there's hope, maybe I will regain it. He had never known what it was to see. And there was a hopelessness about his condition of despair coming to the end of himself, it must have touched the heart of Jesus. 
Jesus, by grace and by mercy and by love and by compassion, stops. Now, we'd like to discuss with you tonight how this man got saved and the meaning of what is written here. One of the things that, that I like personally very much about this story is the fact that before this blind man was aware of Jesus' presence, before he could see him, before he could touch him, before he was even brought to Jesus, Jesus was working in his behalf. Jesus was doing something for him. The blind man wasn't even aware of it. People were discussing the blind man in the presence of the Savior. And the Savior was touched by his pitiful condition. And it was even then, after having spit upon the ground, preparing a vessel, if you will, please, a vehicle that would convey his touch to the eyes of the blind man and bring him his salvation. And this touches me very deeply because I know that when I was blind and set along the road of life faking, in my darkness and in my sin and in my lost condition, before I'd ever heard the Savior's voice, before I'd ever touched him or known him, and before he had touched me and opened mine eyes and cleansed me, he was working in my behalf. Some place there were those who were talking about me in the presence of the Lord. Even though I'm not too much impressed with what they said, I am impressed with the fact that they were talking about him in the presence of the Lord. They drew his attention to this blind man, even though their prayers may have been misguided. They asked a theological question about him, but nevertheless he was brought into the presence of the Lord by these disciples, and the Lord Jesus began to work for the salvation of this man before this man ever knew that Jesus even knew where he was. I look back in my life. I can't look back in yours and tell you what's happened, but I can look back in mine. And judging by what he has done for me, I would say that he's doing that for you too. If you're here unsaved, Jesus is working for your salvation. He's, you're being brought to his attention by those who know you to see your lost condition and name you in the presence of the Savior. He's working. He's bringing things together in your life that would provide for you a divine opportunity to have your eyes open and to see Jesus and to know him if you really wanted to. This meeting here tonight is a divine appointment. Working in your behalf, he drew you to this meeting and gives you this message that tells you that where you are tonight you can be saved and have your eyes open and see Jesus and know him and love him as your Savior, just as this blind man did. Be changed, to be transformed, to become a marvel to your family and a mystery to the society in which you live and a misfit in the religious world around you, but nevertheless to be his. Maybe outside the camp as this blind man will end up, but you will also be inside the veil with Jesus, where you have a living reality in the fellowship that he experienced with Jesus. He's working in your behalf. Only God himself knows how many prayers were prayed for me and how many were prayed for you before those prayers were answered in a way that was exceeding abundant above all that that asker ever asked or thought. I know there was a time when I must have looked hopeless to my mother and to my father. I know there was a time when I must have looked hopeless to the Christians that saw me and observed me by the road of life, wild like that demoniac, totally untamed, cutting myself and crying and living in the places of death, and seeking the fellowship of the dead. I must have looked like a hopeless case. Well, many times I had bonds and fetters on my hands and feet, too, and I broke them, just like the, the madman broke the chains and the shackles when they put them on. I must have looked hopeless, blind, sitting by the side of the road begging, never had been able to see anything, didn't look like I ever would see anything. 
but I wasn't hopeless. There isn't anyone that's hopeless as long as Jesus lives. Jesus saves the hopeless. They're the only kind he can save. He saves the kind that everybody gives up on. He saves the outcasts that the temple can't help. The blind men that religion can't cure. Jesus saves the lost. He can take those who are in the gutter most and he can lift them to the uttermost and save them by his life. For he doesn't offer to the blind man a way of life. He offers him life itself. He doesn't offer him a good, strong cane that will help him get around in life. He offers him sight. He doesn't give him a seeing eye dog or a guide or a book of Braille to read that will tell him how to live and conduct himself. He gives him his eyes so he can see where he's going, so he can see who saved him, so he can see men as they really are and see himself as he really is and see God for what he is revealed in the face of Jesus. This is the marvel of the gospel. God doesn't offer us a way of life. He offers us life itself. He doesn't give to us some philosophy or some religious rule or regulation. He doesn't offer us some law by which we must live. He offers us the power to become the sons of God by giving us the life of his Son, the Lord Jesus. This is good news. That's why the gospel is called the gospel. It's good news to the sinner. Jesus comes along to the hopeless man, working in his behalf for the man's ever aware of him. For he ever experiences the touch of the Savior's hand, Whoever hears his voice, Jesus is concerned about him. Jesus is dealing with his people about him. Jesus is talking about him. Jesus is preparing to save him. And all of it unknown to this poor blind man. He's just sitting there in his darkness. And then if you will, please, I'd like to call to your attention to the fact that everything I've ever read in the Gospel of John is filled with speculation about the spittle and about the, the earth upon which he spit and the clay which was made from him. Every commentator that I have ever read and every book that even mentions this incident points to the spittle and the clay and expounds them as Jesus using material means to heal. kid you not. And they go into great length to explain how that among the people of Jesus' time there was great superstition that mud packed upon the eyes had some sealing, uh, healing merit and uh, that Jesus couldn't just speak and open his eyes because that would just stagger the faith of that poor blind man. But if he put the clay upon his eyes the blind man could feel the clay and know that he had been anointed with a healing ointment and it would gender faith in him. But I say the faith would be in the ointment and not in the Savior if that were the case. And not a single writer, at least the writers in my library, have ever mentioned the most obvious of all the truths of the story. And that is that everything Jesus does in the story and everything that happens to the blind man is to be received by interpretation. Because he uses that phrase when he speaks of the pool of Siloam. The Holy Spirit adds, by interpretation, it means sent. So there is an interpretation to the story. The right interpretation brings us life. The wrong interpretation brings us a rather uninteresting story of healing by medicinal means. I'll tell you what I think the clay stands for, and I'll tell you what I think the spittle in the earth is all about. Here stands the unsaved man in his darkness and his blindness, hopeless, helpless, and here stands the Savior. But the Savior does not touch him directly. 
The Savior deals with him through a vehicle, through a vessel. The Savior uses something in his hand to touch this man. Something which he makes. Something which he makes with his own hands and prepares specially for each individual case. And if you allow me just to give you a little free interpretation of this verse, he made a special earthen vessel with his own hands and then took that vessel in his hands and anointed the eyes of the blind man by means of the vessel, through the vessel and by the vessel. He doesn't touch the man's eyes directly. He uses a vessel through which his saving touch is imparted. The vessel does not save the man. The vessel only accomplishes one thing. It sends him to the pool. It's at the pool he receives his sight. It's at the fountain he's made whole. But the vessel is that intermediate agency between that sinner and the Savior. Now, the New Testament Scripture speaks of those who are used in the hand of Jesus as earthen vessels. It speaks about vessels under glory and honor and vessels under dishonor, under shame. And if he uses earthen vessels in his hands to touch the lives of others, then why is it not simply the meaning of this clay? which he made. How did he make it? Well, he spat on the ground. And man was made from the dust of the earth. He was made from the dirt of the ground. And this special vehicle was made by the Savior spitting upon the ground. Now, I don't know all that means, but I know one thing. Wherever I read about spittle in the Scripture, it stands for humiliation, stands for a brokenness, a humbling, a bringing down low. When they spat upon the face of the Savior, it humiliated him. It humbled him publicly. When Shimei spat upon King David, he was humbled in the eyes of Shimei, brought down low. And so Jesus... <laughs> working in the life of the clay humbles him brings him down low where he can use him can't use him unless he brings him down low unless he humbles him because unless he humbles him he won't submit himself to the Savior's hand you can't take dry dirt and make an ointment out of it it won't stick together now, will it? No. You can't form anything out of dry dirt with your hands. You try it and it will just drift through your fingers. It won't submit itself to be worked, to be made. And that word means in the original Greek to fashion out of the existing materials. So here's what we have. We have Jesus taking the existing materials, the ground, the dirt, the he spat upon it. He humbled it. He brought it down low. And he took his hands and he worked with that dirt until he had himself a suitable clay. This explains many times the hand of the Lord Jesus in your life. It explains why he allows you to be humbled. Why he allows you to be broken. Why he brings you down low from time to time to make you a, a usable vessel in his hand, to make you something that's workable and tractable, something that will submit and something that will yield to the, the hand of the potter. You're reading the 18th chapter of Jeremiah, how Jeremiah came down to the potter's house. He stood in the door of the potter's house and watched him, and the Lord instructed him there. He called Jeremiah's attention to the fact that the potter took the clay and put it on the wheel, as the wheel spun the clay round and round, the potter pressed his hands upon it just so. 
They begin to shape it into a vessel. And all of a sudden, the clay burst in his hands, went to pieces. It was caused by the resistance of that clay to the hand of the potter. Some imperfection and perhaps a stone. Something in the life of that clay that would not yield to the hand of the potter. And so the vessel was broken for a moment. Well, Jeremiah expected the potter to take the clay and throw it on the dung pile and say, I'm finished with you, but he didn't. He patiently and tenderly and lovingly and with compassion gathered up the pieces and he put it back on the wheel. And he worked with it again. And he kept working with it until finally he had shaped it into a vessel for his glory, for his honor. That's what he does with our lives as Christians. We resist the hand of the potter so much, don't we? Too much. And there's so much in our lives that, that is hard and can't be shaped. It breaks us too many times in the Savior's hands, but he never, never, never loses his patience in our lives. I think one verse that has kept me steady through many a storm was a verse in Lamentations where Jeremiah you know, was called a weeping prophet, and I must be relation to him. I've never been able to preach without weeping. I don't try, and sometimes I try not to, and I can't. And that's all right. I'm not sorry for it. It says in the Old Testament, the Lord has our tears in the bottle, and I've often wondered how big that bottle will be by the time I see the Lord. But Jeremiah was called a weeping prophet. Filled with such compassion, he went out in the streets of Jerusalem, lay upon his back in the street, wept. People wouldn't listen to him preach, so he just lay down on his back and wept. And he thought, if they won't hear my preaching, maybe they would at least pay attention to my tears. And they paid attention to his tears and gave him an opportunity to preach. The weeping prophet was discouraged and he was despondent when he wrote the book of Lamentations and he felt that God had forsaken him. He felt that God was finished with him. He'd never use him again. He tries to describe his innermost feelings. The psychiatrist would read the book of Lamentations. He'd say, Jeremiah was crazy. He'd say he was overcome with melancholy. But, oh, read it. This man pours his heart out and he said, I feel like a bear with strong teeth that hold of me. I feel like a lion will destroy me. He goes on, he sees all of his own wickedness and all of his own failure and he expects God like a roaring lion to fall upon him and destroy him. But in the midst of his lamentation, in the midst of his weeping, in the midst of his sorrow, he is reminded of the goodness of the Lord. And he cries out and he said, Why, were it not for the Lord's mercy, the Lord's goodness to us, we would be utterly concerned. And he cried out, Why, why great is his faithfulness. I am unfaithful, but he's always faithful. Why, his compassions are new every morning. What a wonderful anchor that is for a troubled soul like Jeremiah. That every morning when the sun rises in the east, every morning when I look out my bedroom window and see the sun coming up over the edge of the hill, it's a sign to me and an assurance to me from my Heavenly Father that we start today even. His compassions are new for me that morning, just like it was the very first morning of my life. Just like it was the very first time he'd ever dealt with me. Like it was the very first experience of him being my father and me being his son. We start today like it was our very first day together. And you know, that verse has comforted me because... I see so much of my failure and I see so much of my sin and so much of my fault and in my mind it builds up in a big backlog and I think of how much is in the past and I think surely any day now the Lord is going to become very discouraged with me he's going to say oh I just can't travel with you anymore day after day it's the same failure day after day it's the same thing but here's this verse right back there in the Old Testament buried there and yet discovered by the Holy Spirit for us. The Father's compassion is new 
for me every morning. That's new for you every morning. And though we may close every day of our lives with the pieces of our life lying broken on the potter's junk pile, every morning as we go to a new day, he puts us on the wheel again. And he exerts the pressure of his hands in our lives. And he keeps that up until we resist, till we quit resisting, start yielding to him in the way that pleases him. And every day, he fashions us into a vessel that he can use. He wants to use us. We are the instrument between his hand and the eyes of the blind. The gospel is in us. He has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. And all just in the last few months, this has become wonderfully clear to me. All so many years, I believe, that the gospel has been committed to us like you know, like that letter to Garcia was given by the president to that messenger who went to Cuba. Or like some officer calls a courier and gives him a message and says, Here it is, now go do with it as I command you. And this is all I'd ever heard all my life, that the gospel handed over to us as a sacred charge and said, Here, now go propagate it. The gospel is in us. I mean by that that we are the living good news of God's reconciling work in the cross of Calvary. We're the living witness of it, the living evidence of it, the living proof of it. We can just stand by the side of the road of life and preach the gospel, not by saying or by doing as much as being what we have been made by the grace of God. We are the gospel. We are the instrument between the Savior's hand and the blind. The words of an old friend of mine come back to me very often. A man who's yet unsaved. Very wicked, ungodly man who's yet unsaved. But he hangs on in this life with one glimmer of hope. And the glimmer of hope which he constantly tells me about is this. When I'm ready to get completely discouraged and just give up and die, he says, I remember what God did in your life. And I say, if he can do it in your life, he can do it in mine. It's the gospel that's preached in the reality of a transformed life that is the argument that cannot be removed in the heart of the unsaved. They can answer all your theological questions. They can reason away all of your philosophical propositions. They can take all your dead dogmas and your empty creeds and meaningless rituals and poke holes in them. There's one thing they can't gainsay, and that's a man who was once blind and set and begged and now can see. And a man who just keeps saying, I can see because Jesus did this for me. Can't do anything with that testimony. We're the instrument that God uses to test the blind. And oh, I think this is a this is a wonderful explanation to the heavy hand of the Lord upon our lives from time to time, don't you? Making us, it says in the Greek, fashioning from the existing materials the kind of vessel we can use, the kind of clay that will do the job. All, each individual case is different. The blind man required just the right kind of an earthen vessel through which the touch of the Lord Jesus could be transmitted. He can't work through you like he can work through me. And he can't work through me like he works through you. You know, you have a circle of influence in this society. And you have a place that I don't occupy and no other man does. You come into contact every day of your lives with people who perhaps have their hearts opened by the Holy Spirit to you, whose hearts will never be opened to me. It's like throwing a stone and into the river it makes big ripples and the ripples go out and only God himself knows where they end you touch one life and that life touches another and it touches another and another and another but each individual is in the body of the Lord Jesus where it has pleased the head to place him and your circle of influence is different from mine I can't win your family to Jesus if you can't win them to Jesus 
I can't reach into your circle of friends and acquaintances and do what can't be done through your life. Church business doesn't believe this. They think the preacher is a hired soul winner. He's the professional saver. So when they have an unsaved friend or relative, they always bring the preacher. Or call the preacher and say, go see my son or my brother or my husband or my father. Jesus said to the demoniac, it's you. It's you who must reach the people of the Catholics. And to the blind man, it's you that must stand in the midst of your family and in the midst of your friends. Not do, be what I've made you. Just stand there seeing. And sooner or later, your seeing is going to do something. Because a man who's been blind from birth can't just start seeing without causing some kind of an uproar. He got reaction all right. He got plenty of it. A reaction from his family, a reaction from his friends, a reaction from organized religion, reaction from the whole world around him immediately. Because they saw too. When he saw, they saw. When he was able to see, they could see that he could see. And seeing that he could see demanded an answer. And the answer he had, and the answer was not a way. It was the way. It was Jesus. And he kept answering, Jesus. Jesus is the answer. He's done this for me. He'd do it for you. Wonderful truth. The first contact that this blind man had with Jesus was through the clay. Savior's hand never touched him direct. It touched him through the clay. It touched him through the earthen vessel. It touched him through something of earth. It touched him through something that he could relate to, something he could feel, something he could touch with his own hands, something that he could sense and know in reality. You with me? Man can get hold of a piece of clay. He can touch it and feel it. And the hand of Jesus anointed the eyes of the blind man through the clay by means of the earthen vessel. What a privilege it was for that bit of clay to be the instrument in between. Clay didn't do anything. just yielded himself to the hand of the saviors all. Clay didn't contribute anything. Clay didn't have any power in it. In fact, clay had problems of its own. It had been spat upon, <laughs> humbled and broken and molded and made, and the pressure of the Savior's hand sometimes was great in our lives to produce this, to make this effect. So, this was what happened that day. Jesus took a usable vessel. A yielded vessel, a willing vessel, a submitted vessel which he made himself. It didn't become that way by its own righteousness. He made it that way. Jesus made that vessel be what he wanted it to be. That vessel may not have wanted to be made like that, but Jesus made it that way. And after he had made it, he took it in his hand. And it was the instrument in between. On one hand of the vessel was the Savior's hand. On the other side were the blinded eyes of the man. This was the way Jesus anointed him. His first contact with Jesus, through the vessel. The effect, anointed. His eyes were anointed. He felt the touch of Jesus, there was an indirect touch. He had come into contact with the Savior, there was an indirect contact. This is what happens when Jesus brings us into contact with the lost. It's an indirect contact, but they're in contact with Jesus. It's an indirect touch, but they're in touch with Jesus. A man once told me, he said, I'm greatly convicted because I go to my work and I sit at my desk all day and there is an opportunity to say anything about Jesus. There isn't any opportunity to preach about Jesus. You know, you people who work at a desk job or a plant or whatever, they don't hire you to preach. 
They want a preacher to go to ministerial lives and hire. They hire a bookkeeper. They want a man who will keep books and keep his mouth shut. They want a machine operator. They hire a man who operates the machine and leave the preaching for Sunday. And the man said to me, I was having problems because I sit there all week long and I never get to say anything about Jesus to anybody. And I know the Lord must be very, very displeased with me. And I said, Brother, your presence there in that office makes the presence of Jesus there in that office. You being at that desk, you're preaching the gospel every hour you're sitting there, if you're saved. I believe that. Do you believe that? Jesus is in you. If you're a Christian, he, he lives in you by the Holy Spirit. You can't walk in a room without taking Jesus in that room. Jesus can't go in that room without his presence being known. They may not know who it is or what it is, but I said his presence would be known there. They know there's something different about you. They talk about you behind your back. They get in the restroom and have a little conference about you. Say, that queer guy out there, that funny man. What's the matter with him? He doesn't laugh at the dirty jokes. He doesn't say anything humorous about sin. They know you don't have to preach. I'm not saying don't preach if you have an opportunity. I'm just saying that preaching isn't the name of the game. The name of the game is being an instrument in the hand of the Lord Jesus through which the touch of the Savior's hand can be experienced in the life of the unsaved. When the saved are brought in the presence of the unsaved, the unsaved are brought into an indirect touch with Jesus. And if they want more light than that, they'll get it. Because if they're yielded to that touch of Jesus through the clay, they'll hear him say, through that clay, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I told you the clay didn't have any power. The clay couldn't save him. The clay didn't do a thing. The clay just lay in the Savior's hand and let him use it. I'll tell you what sent the man to the pool. It was the word of the Lord Jesus Christ sent him to the pool. He heard the word of God, but first the anointing. And I know, it isn't said here, but I know that the anointing came first and the Savior awaited the response of the blind man to the anointing. Then the command, go wash in the pool of Siloam and come see. Jesus had spoken about himself being the light of the world and everything he does in saving the lost, he does according to his word. And he does by the power of his word. But the word must become flesh first. And the living word of God lives in us. And it is through us that the living word of God is given the opportunity to speak to the heart of the unsaved, willing to hear and listen. I thought this afternoon my ambition in this life, if you ask me what my life's ambition is, what I want for myself more than anything in the world, I would tell you it is this. I would to God I could be a bit of clay spit upon by the Savior if necessary to make me tractable and workable but a piece of clay that he can make into whatever kind of a vessel he wants to make it into it will anoint the eyes of some blind man and send him to the pool you know where the pool is don't you it's the cross of Calvary all the anointing Jesus ever does on the eyes of the blind and all the words he ever speaks to the unsaved is to one end, to send him to that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath its flood and lose all their guilty stains. To send him to the pool. Clay can't save him. Clay may make his eyes feel good. The clay may comfort him, or the clay may irritate him. Who knows? 
The clay may do many other things in his life, but the clay can't open his eyes and the clay can't save him. And not even a touch of the Savior's hand in this story could change that blind man's life through that clay. It took the pool. Because you have to go to the pool. It's the pool is where the thing is done. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed at Calvary's cross. And the interpretation of that blood and the interpretation of that death being made real in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's what does the work. It's the power of the Word of God about the pool that saves men. It's the record God has given of the pool that saves men. This is only the preliminary work. This is only the convicting work. This is only the, the preface to the great thing that was done at the Pool of Siloam. And you notice the writer, which is obviously the Holy Spirit working through John, doesn't let us go to the pool to see what happened. We just have his record that he went there and he washed and he came to see. Because when a man goes to the pool, it says nobody there but him and God. And all others are shut out. He has to go there alone. He has to go there in faith. He has to go there believing the word of God that if I go and wash, I'll see. He has to go there under the anointing of the hand of Jesus through the earthen vessel and say, I'll go because Jesus said go, and I believe him, and I trust him. I'll understand how the pool can save me. I don't understand about the water or the anointing or the clay or anything. But I know Jesus said if I'd go and wash, I could see, and I'm going. And I'm going to wash, and I'll see. And he did. And he came seeing. Isn't that a wonderful word? He came seeing. Just seeing up a storm. You see, it's obvious to you by now, that his salvation was by grace. But it was through faith. There's the girl that demands his response, right? The command of faith, go. The, the naked word of God, go. It's by grace, totally by grace. All of it by grace. Grace that Jesus stopped where he was and grace that Jesus loved him and had compassion on him and grace that Jesus would work in the, in the life of an earthen vessel to touch him and grace that there would be an earthen vessel made fit for the Savior's hand and grace that the blind men could feel the touch of Jesus' hand through that vessel. But they can only go so far. And there's the word of faith. Go. Go. Go wash. And you'll come see. Go wash. And you'll come see. It's my promise. I find this throughout the New Testament. He said to the man with a withered hand, Stretch forth thine hand. Now he could have healed his hand without that. But it was the word of faith. He stood at Lazarus' tomb and he said, Roll away the stones. He could have raised Lazarus without rolling away the stones. But he had to first of all roll away the stone of unbelief and marry Martha's heart. And that was the word of faith. Roll away the stones. You really believe what you just said to me, Martha? You said you believed I was the resurrection and the life. Show me. Roll the stone away. Roll the stone away. Unbelief has to go before Jesus can work. And there's the word of faith. He said to the man who was upon the bed and carried, you remember, and let down through the tiles and the roof, he said, take up your bed and walk. There was the word of faith again. He said when he stood before the Jews, ready to turn to the Gentiles and to turn away from Israel as a rejected king, he said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't just say, I'll give you rest. He said, come to me. There's the word of faith. Come to me. It says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. Not just hear my voice, he has to open the door. Oh, says works. No, it isn't, because if you open the door, 
It'll only be because He enables you to open the door. If you want to open that door, you can open it. It's as simple as that. Don't get theological about it. If you want to open the door, you can. If you want to believe, you can. But the word of faith is there. Go. If you want to go, you can go. I read one commentary one time on John 9, and the man raised a simple question, silly question, stupid question, ridiculous question. How could a blind man get to the pool of Siloam? He was blind. How could he get there without falling down the ditch? You can do anything Jesus tells you to do, if you want to. Jesus tells you to go to the pool of Siloam and you're too blind to get there by yourself, you can get there because his callings are his enablements. The power of the Word of God will enable you to do whatever he commands you to do, if you want to do it. That's where I part company with the Calvinists, you see. That saves me from a, a terrible limited atonement and irresistible grace and all of the other silliness that makes God a tyrant on his throne playing eeny, meeny, miny, mo the souls of men. It is true that all that depends upon God is provided by grace. It is not God does his part and we do our part. All of the work of salvation is the work of God. All of it is the work of a sovereign, omnipotent God who's worked it all out by grace for us. But the scripture stands that this grace is administered to us through faith. Faith that is not ours. Faith that is also a gift of God to anyone who wants it. This is the glorious truth of the gospel that man can believe if he wants to. Though he be dead in trespasses and sin, though he be too blind to find his way to the pool of Siloam, the word of God bids him go, and he can go if he wanted to. The word of God bid Lazarus come forth, and he can come if he wanted to. He bid the blind man take up his bed and walk, and he can walk and carry his bed if he wanted to. The man with the withered hand can stretch it forth if he wanted to. Jesus told him to. Jesus is Lord of all. He said to the blind man, that word of faith, go. And wash. Comes soon. And I like the fact that he had to go by faith. Faith in the Word of God. You see, the very fact that he moved out of the presence of the disciples and away from Jesus toward the pool was proof that he had believed in his heart of the righteousness. He believed Jesus for ever arrived at the pool so long, didn't he? He believed or he never started. He believed or he never left first, and he just said, Oh, come on now, you're kidding me. The waters of Siloam could never open my eyes. I don't believe that stuff. Tell it to somebody else, but don't tell it to me. I've been blind since I was born, buddy, and nobody's ever been able to open my eyes. Well, I've had every kind of cure there is, and I'm still blind. Now, don't stand there and tell me that if I go and jump in that pool up there by the temple, I'll be able to see. That's unbelief. Like the businessman who stood on the street corner and said to me, Oh, I couldn't believe that stuff. I lived to be a million years old. That's too simple. It doesn't even make any sense. He's still blind. Still begging. Still lost and still on his way to hell because Jesus passed by. And he never responded. He could have gone to the pool. That man believed that Jesus it wasn't so much he believed what he said as it was that he believed him. It'd be hard to believe what he said. It would be awful hard for a man who been blind all those years to believe he could jump in a puddle of water and be able to see. I have no doubt he'd been to the Pool of Sloan many times because the Pool of Sloan was a favorite place for those who were ailing. The water was said to have some magical powers. And I imagine he'd been up there and rubbed water from the pool of Siloam on his eyes before just to see if it would work, and it never worked. He believed Jesus. And so we have it refined to a simple truth. He had believed in Jesus, that's all. His salvation was by grace, but it was through faith in Jesus. He believed in Jesus. And he believed that Jesus bid him go to the pool, the pool could cleanse him, and the pool could open his eyes, and the pool could change him. Or he never would have gone, and he went in response to the word of God. 
And whenever God's Word speaks, and whenever Jesus speaks, and whenever Jesus works through a vessel made of clay, it ends up in one thing. Man gets sent to the pool. <laughs> That's the only way it ever ends up. He never bids him join the church or get baptized or do good works. He always gets sent to the pool. Everything in the Word of God sends men to the pool. So let me talk to you about that pool for just a little bit. He was told to go there and wash. Well, what was this pool and where was it? It's called the Pool of Siloam. And notice the Holy Spirit is very careful to say, by interpretation, is sent. Most Greek scholars agree that the correct interpretation of the word Siloam is one O N E one sent or sent one. And the Holy Spirit, as I said, is very careful to tell us that the truth of this story rests upon the right interpretation. You see? It doesn't mean just go to any pool. It means to go to that pool of the sent one. It is there at the sent one pool where you will receive your sight, where you can come see it again, if you want. It's a wonderful pool. It was 53 feet long. It was 18 feet wide. And they said in its time, when it was first built, it was probably around 20 feet deep. It was actually just a big open cistern. And it was fed by a subterranean vein of water that seemed to never run dry, and there was a plentiful supply of it. Water, you know, was scarce commodity in that land. And this pool was kept full. It got kind of a sacred type of reputation. Some people had gone there, and you know how people do, and claimed that it had medicinal value and it had healing power and so forth. But it was very closely tied in with the sacrifice and worship of the temple, especially with the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you'll study the context of this story, you will find that it came at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles closed officially in the seventh chapter of John, because when Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That is to me one of the most dramatic incidents in all of the life of Jesus apart from his crucifixion and Gethsemane. You can't imagine what was going on in that day, and I'll tell you because it has to do with this blind man, if you'll let me tell you. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, as the final religious celebration, the priests came out of the temple, down the broad steps of the temple, and made their way to the Pool of Siloam, which was nearby to the Temple of Solomon, then called the Temple of Herod, because he remodeled it. And when they came to the Pool of Siloam, the priest brought with him a golden pitcher. And with great ceremony and pomp, and with the sounding of great silver trumpets, a solemn hush fell upon all of that mass of people while the priest re reached into the pool of Siloam with his golden pitcher, filled it full of the sacred water, and carried it to the head of the procession, back to the temple steps and up the steps and into the temple and into the very holy place itself to the altar of sacrifice. And there he poured out, without a word, the water from the golden pitcher. While he was doing this, the people were standing outside chanting from the book of Psalms. They were chanting that portion. It was a promise of God given to the house of David that someday Messiah would come. The Messiah would save his people. And so they quoted from the Messianic Psalms, and one of their favorite quotes was that with joy they would draw from the wells of salvation. When Jesus came, when Messiah came, when God sent his Son... Now, if you have that for a background, and you go back and read the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, oh, it's a tense and dramatic moment. 
I saw at one time like I was there. The priest carrying in his trembling hands the pitcher, the golden pitcher filled with the sacred water. He goes up the steps, pours out this water upon the altar of sacrifice, and the people are chanting about the wells of salvation and about the joy that will come when God sends Messiah. And Messiah was there, standing in their midst, rejected, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, unknown, esteemed, smitten of God. And all of a sudden, in a solemn moment, he cries with a loud voice. The Greek says he gave a piercing, ear-shattering shriek. And you know what he cried? He cried out, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink, and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He was that true water of the pool of Siloam. And he was the sent one. And the fountain that flowed from him was the fountain of life. And you see, it's in this setting that he heals the blind man. Because all of Jerusalem had just been to the pool of Siloam. They'd seen this thing. And perhaps the blind man had even heard him cry. And so when he sends the blind man to the pool, he is in type and in picture and by interpretation sending him to Calvary. It was Calvary where the Lord Jesus was poured out who carried his own precious blood from his own pool of Siloam in the golden pitcher to heaven's mercy seat, and there he poured it out with joy and opened the well of salvation for all who would come to him and drink. So you see, there is something significant about his words to the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam and come see. And you remember to the start of our story, I told you that Jesus made it plain that he was talking about the work which he'd come into this world to do. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. And so he sent the man to the pool of Siloam. By type he sent him to the cross of Calvary. They told him to go there and wash. You know, I was thinking about what the man might have thought. He believed Jesus. Oh, he did. I don't know whether a guide led him to the pool of Siloam. I have an idea he did because the guide brought me there. It wasn't a sea and I dog, but a faithful servant, the Holy Spirit himself, led me to the fountain. He let me come there. He brought me there by his own power, his own enablement. I imagine a blind man standing there by the pool. They told him it was 20 foot deep. And he knew there was an awful lot of water there. And he wondered how that water was going to open his eyes, but Jesus said it would. He doesn't see the pool, for he's blind, but he can see Jesus in his mind's eye, and he believes it. And he just takes the plunge. He just jumps in. Because Jesus told him to go there and bathe. Go there and wash. He jumps in by faith alone. Word of God tells us to go to Calvary's cross, and there a fountain was opened for uncleanness. There Jesus shed his blood to open your blind eyes, to save you from your sins, to change you, to transform you, to make you righteous in the sight of God. And I don't understand it. It's 20 feet deep to me. It's too deep, it's too long, it's too wide. I can't comprehend it. This I know, the Word of God says it so. And if I plunge in by faith, I'll be able to see. I did that. I just jumped in. I didn't understand it. I just said, Lord, with the little understanding I have, with what little bit of faith I can find, what little bit of knowledge I have in my heart about this thing, I just trust you with what I've got to trust you with and love you with what I've got to love you with. I jump. I'll leave the details to you. You say, if I plunge, if I cast myself into, if I put myself upon 
the precious fountain which you opened there, I'll see, and I'll be made whole, and I'll be delivered from darkness into light. And I was, and I came seeing, and I've been seeing ever since. And this mystifies my friends. It was a marvel to my family. It made me a misfit in the religious world. It took me out of the temple, it put me on the sidewalk, but with Jesus. <laughs> We'll do the same for you. I just, I, I'm going to close now in just a minute or two, maybe three. But I want to tell you that the word interpretation comes from the Greek word hermes or hermesi. And hermesi was one of the classical Greek deities. And he was called the God of Language. And uh, it's interesting to me because the Holy Spirit is saying this by the use of the word. When Jesus said, go wash in the pool of the Lord, the Holy Spirit is saying, now I'm going to tell you in plain language. That's what interpretation means. He was the God of language and means to translate from one language to another. To put it into language you can understand. So the Holy Spirit saying, in language you can understand, he was sending him to the pool of the sent one. Jesus was the sent one. He was the one sent from the Father to give himself in the death of the cross for the blind men and women, boys and girls of this world so I close with this very thought provoking idea it does matter what you believe about the pool the right interpretation of the pool is important to your salvation you just can't go to the pool of Siloam and believe what the whole world believes about it in some kind of magic healing type of place where you just stand and rub a little bit on you and you'll get well. The right interpretation about the pool is important, isn't it? You see, everybody preached the pool. Everybody talked about the pool. And everybody went to the pool. But the only people that ever went to the pool and came seen were the people that were sent there by the Lord Jesus with a right understanding in their heart for what they were going there for and who plunged into it by faith alone in Jesus and come out whole. You think about that, okay? Everybody talking about the cross. Everybody preaching Christ, they say. I heard a man on the radio today and he... He really caught my attention because for about five minutes I thought he was really preaching the gospel, I believe. He was saying all the right words and he was just going right down the line and he just got right to the point of Calvary where he had the listener right face to face with the finished work of Christ and he turned right around in about two sentences and wiped out everything he'd said. He said, you don't need to think now just because Jesus went to the cross and died for you that everything that's necessary for your salvation has been done by God. Why, preacher, he said, do you mean you believe in eternal security? Yes, I believe you're eternally secure as long as you live a Christian life. And continue to have faith. But when your faith fails and you don't live a Christian life, you're not secure anymore. And he undone everything he'd said in just a few sentences. He was talking about the pool. But he had the wrong interpretation of the pool. I'm not putting any value on the human understanding or mental comprehension or intellectual assent or anything like that. I'm not saying you have to understand the gospel in order to be saved. I'm not telling you that you have to be able to comprehend with your mind the ramifications of the cross. But I'm telling you one thing. If you don't have in your heart the right interpretation of what happened at the cross of Calvary, you're not going to be saved. He went there by simple faith in what Jesus told him. It was Jesus who made the pool to have its power. 
And the power of the pool of the cross of Calvary is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he shed for the remission of our sins and this incorruptible and eternal blood of God's Son, which was laid down, contained his eternal life, poured out at the cross of the substitution the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. No use going to the pool unless you go with the right interpretation. And you'll go with the right interpretation if you're sent by the Word of God. <laughs> because the Word of God will send you with the right understanding. And then the introduction to Sunday morning's message, and if Jesus doesn't come, it's going to be a happy Sunday morning for me because I am anxious to get to this place. He went, and he washed, and he came to see. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't come shout, and he came to see. It wasn't feeling that he was experiencing at the moment, it was seeing. He was a transformed man. Believe it? Changed. Never be the same again. Never. Oh, his facial expression may have looked similar, but he was changed. He was different. Probably didn't weigh any more. Wasn't any taller. Suit just looked the same when he came back, except a little wet. There was something about him. He was changed. And this was the proof, the evidence of the power of the gospel he had heard. This is the evidence of salvation. This is the proof of salvation. We're changed. And the first change he experienced was that he could see. And the fact that he could see would change everything in his life sooner or later. Wouldn't it? You better believe it. I bet he stopped wearing them purple ties. <laughs> now that he could see what purple really was. <laughs> now I imagine he changed his sitting place. I don't imagine he sat in the same place because the man can see he usually picks a little better place in the curb. I don't imagine he baked anymore. He didn't have to. The world didn't have anything he wanted. <laughs> He had everything he wanted and everything he needed in Jesus. And the fact that he could see was to change his whole life. That's the primary basic change that comes when we accept Jesus as our Savior. We can see it. We've been able to see ourselves. And we saw the cross with the right interpretation. And we saw Jesus. And all the way back to Jesus, he saw men as he'd never seen them before. And he saw the world around him for what it was. He saw the dirty rags he was wearing. He saw his life in shambles. And determined that from now on it was going to be different. Because he could see. He was changed, friends. And his neighbors found it out right away. Because <laughs> we're going to start Sunday morning telling you how his neighbors began to talk about him. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that the blind man's neighbors talked about him. That's one of the good signs. They talked about him because they couldn't stand him going around seeing him. But because he could see. They ten times rather had him to be a poor, dirty, blind man in rags at their mercy, begging from them to be able to walk down the street with his head up and able to see and know where he was going, where he'd been. He was a constant source of conviction to him. No wonder they hated him. Just being there and seeing was a conviction to him. Thank you so much for the reality of this and the lives of the saints. Thank you for this precious message. This was a precious message, Father. We thank you for it. We've seen Jesus loved him tonight in a new way. We receive it all with thanksgiving, but, oh, Father, we pray that there may be someone here in this meeting who in their own heart tonight, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will be led to the pool of Siloam, where they quit their questioning and quit their arguing, quit their resisting, and just go at the word of Jesus and fall into the precious work of Calvary by faith alone. 
knowing that he who sent them will change them and transform them and they'll come see and they can see Jesus as we see him and they'll see themselves and each other as we see them thank you Father for this precious precious good news in Jesus name we pray Amen Lord